Good morning. Welcome to Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship located on occupied ancestral land of the Muscogee Creek Nation. My name is Aisha Alam, and I will be your service associate today. We welcome all of you to our service, especially those of you who are searching for a spiritual home. Many of us were once too, seeking for something larger than ourselves to which we could belong, a sense of rootedness to hold us as we create meaning together. We do that well here, though not perfectly, in this congregation, we strive not for perfection, but for authenticity and connection. Whether it's your first time here with us or your hundredth time, we hope that you'll find your questions that stretch you, people to befriend you, and liberal religious values that challenge you to join us in loving boldly, living justly, and welcoming radically. On behalf of the members of this fellowship, I extend a special welcome to all the visitors who are visiting, joining us for the first time, and to those of you who still feel like visitors. If you have not already done so, please fill out a digital visitor card by visiting auuf.org forward slash visitor so that we may welcome you. You may also contact our minister, Rev. Chris Rothbauer at minister at auuf.org with any questions or concerns that you may have. Let us move into the service, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. Our opening words are from Paul H. Bicknell. There are some heights to which we have not risen and never will. There are some depths to which we have not fallen and never will, we pray. Somewhere between there are places where we can reach up and reach out for the strength we need for our journey. This is such a place. Thus, we pause for Because we didn't do anything for our newlyweds, Lisa and Carter, and they were so uh, generous yesterday when choir practiced at their house. Yeah. Down below the Mason Dixon line, where the honeysuckles are inclined, that's where southern waves blow, that's where the daisies grow. Girls up north in the gate pottery are swirling around in society, singing a song, Dixie Darling, where I long to be my Dixie Darling. Listen to the song I sing, beat the silver moon, with my banjo riding chain. My heart is ever true, I love no one but you, my Dixie Darling, my Dixie dear. I invite you to light your chalice with us this morning with these words from Leslie Takahashi. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a deeper joy in this life we share. As is our tradition, we also light a candle in solidarity with those families that are separated at our southern border. I would like to invite you to join us in our opening hymn, hymn number 128 in the gray hymnal, for all that is our life. The words will be shared on the screen. Sing our thanks and praise for all our 
we proclaim the warmth and caring of our community is by sharing our joys, concerns, and milestones. We invite those who wish to use the Zoom chat box to type your joy, concern, or milestone during the music for meditation. If you wish for your joy or concern to be acknowledged, but don't want to share it, you may also type that you have an unspoken joy or concern. <laughs> message from Ralph Banks. Ralph says, I would like to express my gratitude for the cards, the calls, the emails, text messages, and personal outpourings of love and sympathy received following the death of my mother on May the 4th. Are there any others? May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community, those shared out loud and those held in silence, be received into the care and concern of all present. Please join me in the spirit of meditation in whatever way feels right with these words from Don W. Vaughn Forrester. Like pendulums, we swing from hunger to hunger, for in the one great truth, absolute, eternal, mystical, 
to hunger for simple, near and familiar truths that change as we change, grow as we grow. Like pendulums, we swing from hunger for cosmic imperatives, commanding us to expand ourselves, to hunger for immediate and authentic inner promptings, urging us to be ourselves. We would be right with heaven, so we swing outward. We would fulfill our own heart, so we swing inward. We would grasp the sacred, and we would create ourselves. We have this dual hunger to serve the cosmos that commands us to become more than we would and to be our genuine selves, content with what we are. So we ride this pendulum in hunger for life. We ride from truth that calls us out to truths that call us in. And all because the gravity of life pulls across our hunger, never allowing us to stay on one side or the other, always moving us into new urgency for the wholeness that would bind both the cosmic and the personal. And so life pulls as we swing from truth to truths, from cosmos to self, from mystery to clarity, from out to in. It is our state to swing and to be drawn ever into another swing. This is the motion that makes ours a human life. May the great gravity of life, which pulls us along an unknown holy axis, never let the pendulums we are cease swinging until the truths we seek and the truths we are are one. A religious community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. As members and friends of this religious community, we share our time, our energy, our creativity, imagination, and vision, our talents, skills, and gifts and the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and broad. A river that is made of many streams, sustains life and refreshes the land through which it flows. But the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real our shared values and vision. We will now receive an offering for your support of this religious community and its hard work in the world. You are invited to give generously and joyfully as you are able. To make a donation online via, via PayPal, please visit auuf.org forward slash donate. If you are writing a check, please make sure your check is payable to AUUF with a note on the memo line about whether it is for the offering or your pledge and mail it to PO Box 669, Auburn, Alabama, Three six eight three one. The offering will now be received. Ain't gonna work tomorrow. Ain't gonna work next day. Ain't gonna work tomorrow. It may be a rain. I'm going to leave this country, I'm going around the world, I'm going to leave 
this country for the sake of that one little girl. I ain't gonna work tomorrow, ain't gonna work next day. Lord, I ain't gonna work tomorrow, it may be a rainy day. I hang my head in sorrow, hang my head and cry. Hang my head in sorrow, my darling goes passing by. I ain't gonna work tomorrow. Ain't gonna work next day Lord, I ain't gonna work tomorrow It may be a rainy day Whoa. <laughs> A reading from Jane Rainey Rezepka. A one-paragraph newspaper article describes a subway platform during the morning rush hour at Grand Central Terminal. A train pulls in, a well-dressed woman gets off. Before the doors close, the woman realizes she's holding only one of her leather gloves. She looks back into the train and spots the matching one on the seat. It is obviously too late to dash back in to retrieve it, so with a cavalier shrug, she flings her arm out and the doors about to close tosses her glove onto the seat alongside its mate. The doors shut and the train pulls away. What a great image. One could use it, I suppose, as a metaphor for facing the inevitable or arguing for an elder orderly universe, or even with a little stretch for sharing the good things in life. But as we move into the summer season, the metaphor that comes to mind is one of letting go to throw a favorite leather glove into the oblivion of a moving train must involve small pangs of uncertainty, pangs of some degree of loss, pangs of upset. After a lifetime of struggling not to lose our mittens, then our gloves, cavalier abandonment does not come easy. In New England, at least, our pattern is to cling as we cling to our gloves. To routine, hard work, obligation, all fall, all winter, and right through to the 4th of July. But in the summertime, there is letting go. We close up our schools and our churches, put on our overcoats and mothballs, put our overcoats in mothballs and dust off the swan boats, the lobster pots, and last year's new gas grill. We need that. We need to cast that glove of responsibility back into the train. We need a vigorous and decisive toss about how about now to free ourselves of the confining gloves of life, even if we love them. And the train's about to leave. Welcome to our sanctuary of the of the porch. Um, <laughs> it's a it's an interesting time to be preaching about laziness with a nice porch swing behind me. Uh, I thought about asking the folks who are here to sit on the porch swing behind me, but they didn't like that idea. So, so as a kid, I don't think I, it was ever explicitly told to me that work was a virtue. However, there was the unconscious message I picked up from an early age from the adults around me. I was very aware that unlike my father, my mother never worked until I was in first grade when she got a job at a local Hardee's. What she always told me was that she wanted to be home for me in my formative years. And my parents had figured out how to survive on one salary. Going back to work once I was in elementary school just seemed natural. And she worked constantly up until the time she became disabled towards the end of her life. I think she was the last adult I knew who didn't work voluntarily. It, anyone else was either disabled or retired after a lifetime of work. Work was just natural. 
The adults I know didn't identify as Chris's neighbor or Chris's father or Chris's mother, but by their profession. The second thing that would always come out after their name when they were asked who they are. As far back as preschool, I remember teachers playfully inviting us to express what we wanted to be when we grew up. Sometimes my answer would be have to do with my obsession of the week, such as becoming a paleontologist because of my love of dinosaurs at the time. Other times it was simply mimicking what the adults around me were doing, such as working at Hardee's or as a truck driver. Can you imagine me as a truck driver? <laughs> <laughs> In all cases, what is clear to me in hindsight is that I did not have a good idea of what exactly work would entail for me, nor did I understand that in American society, it is a privilege to enjoy your work, one that many people don't have since they take jobs they don't like in order to meet basic needs. I don't think I realized the full gravity of our system until I started working in my teens. I quickly realized that my years of formal and informal education had not prepared me for the despair I felt at being daily dehumanized by both my managers and by customers. The edict from our company was clear. We were there to keep our mouths closed, take the abuse and produce a product that the company could profit off of. Though there were laws put in place to protect me from the most extreme abuses of the system, there was very little said to me about my rights as a working miner. I had no idea that I could have just reported my manager for breaking child labor laws. They did not care about my future my happiness, or my life, even once trying to fight me on workers' compensation for a workplace illness. I spent much of my teens and early 20s going from one job to the next, where I was often seen as a means to an end as very replaceable very quickly. This left me so depressed that most of the time I didn't even have any energy to take steps towards improving my situation, like getting my GED or considering college. I found myself on more than one day off, just slouching around the house, eating junk food and playing video games in an effort to distance myself from my emotional pain. And there are many people who would criticize me for this period in my life say that I was just being lazy and I could have chosen to improve my situation at any time. This sort of sloth was just me wallowing in my vice, they'll say. And if I was a better person, I'd be able to pull myself up by my bootstraps and do something, anything, to get into a better state of being. In other words, if I was just a better person, I would be able to have the American dream, a good paying job I like, a partner, a house with white picket fences and a kids and a dog running around the yard. But reality is so much more complicated, isn't it? <clears throat> what I would argue is that many people in Western cultures have become so good at numbing our emotional warning signs that something is wrong with our lives that we don't even see this sort of lack of motivation as indicative that something is very, very wrong. I sure didn't. At the time, I just thought I wasn't good enough to lead a happy life. Had someone simply helped me understand my apathy as a warning sign to take action rather than as a hindrance to be ignored and numbed and stuffed down, I could have sought help to find a better way to live. Some so psychologists and social scientists have begun pushing back against the idea that these folks are simply lazy 
And if they only put more effort in, they would be fine. Dr. Devin Price from Loyola University of Chicago calls this the laziness lie, a belief system that says hard work is morally superior to relaxation. In their book, Laziness Does Not Exist, Dr. Price lays out three tenets of the laziness lie. One, your worth and your productivity your worth is tied into your productivity. In other words, you're only so good as you can contribute to the economy. Two, you cannot trust your own feelings and limits. These feelings you have of needing something other than work are wrong, and you can't listen to what your body and mind are telling you that you need. And three, there is always something more that you can do. There's, when you get off this call, this service today, there's something else you could be out there doing, they'll say. You should never stop because every second has to be filled with productive activity. Price believes that we grow up accepting these three beliefs as unquestionable. The natural result is that when our bodies reveal bell against their constant demand for productivity, when we pretend that we are robots who must constantly push ourselves to do more and be more, we are actually hurting ourselves, learning that we can't even trust our bodies to tell us what we need. Most of the time, the laziness lie refers to how productive we are in the capitalist economy but can, it can also refer to labor we provide that is not always recognized in our society, such as unpaid volunteer work. So many times I have known activists who felt so bad about the state of the world that they constantly pressed themselves to be at every meeting, every protest, every action for every cause because how could they not? The world is on fire and how dare they think they need to relax rather than keep going. The laziness lie told them that their worth was how much they could affect change in the world, that there is always something more they could be doing and they couldn't trust what they knew they needed. It's hard after all to say no under the laziness lie. Some people go through therapy just to learn how to say no again. I was one of them. I certainly didn't have prob problems saying no as a kid, but the older I got, the more I internalized that I couldn't ever say no. Part of the, why I struggled in my job as a team was my inability to say no when un, to unreasonable demands from my bosses, which ultimately led to me choosing to drop out of school. I believed I was only as good a person as I was a worker, and I thought my bosses knew better what I needed to do than I did. Even into my adult life, I used to never take vacation every year unless someone asked me to. And I never said no to a request to come in on my days off because I figured I might as well be at work producing stuff. I saw this creep up in my life again in my early 20s as I started getting involved in social justice causes. I wanted to do it all. I wanted to go to school. I wanted to have a social and family life and challenge the world all in the same 168 minutes a week that I was allotted to live that we all have. After all, who needs things like sleeping and eating and bathing when there's something else I could be doing? It was a struggle, but I now regularly say no to things, even things I love and care for deeply, because I know I have to be more than the sum of the work that I do. 
I am also a person who needs time to recharge physically, mentally, and spiritually. Dr. Price says that the type of laziness we're talking about here isn't evil. It's a sign from our bodies and our minds that something is deeply wrong. They classify laziness in three categories. Depressed people who are often fighting, who are often doing a full-time job just managing their depression and have trouble being productive in the way society demands. There's also procrastinators who are often caught in a sign of perfectionism, anxiety, distraction, and failure from which they need support overcoming. And there are people who are apathetic, who just don't see the point. And Dr. Price thinks that they've often been failed in some way because they haven't been shown that there's a reason for what they do. The apathetic can reach that place through depression, trauma, oppression, or disenfranchisement. But we need to ask in each case, why does this activity seem so pointless to them rather than just assume that they're being lazy? While the laziness slide tells us that these people just aren't trying hard enough, the emerging paradigm reminds us that these feelings are trying to tell us something. Maybe we feel trapped and don't know how to find a new way of being. It could be we're not making enough things, enough time for the things that are truly important to us. And it could be that we're just not seeing the point of the things we're doing in our lives. And maybe we're just working ourselves beyond what our bodies, minds, and spirits are capable of handling in a normal work week. Learning to listen to these feelings, to slow down and ask what it is we need can be a radical revolution in living. Imagine if you gave yourself permission to say no when you needed to. Just think if you had the support to not only listen to what your body was telling you, but also to figure out how to care for yourself and forge new ways forward. It is indeed radical. It is. You don't need to be everything to everyone. You don't need to learn everything there is to know. Whatever your body, mind, and spirit are telling you that you need will be enough. And in the end, you just might find that you're more creative, better able to problem solve, and more aware of what matters because you're willing to take your own needs seriously because what society has deemed laziness can actually lead to healing if we let it. The key is self-compassion. How willing am I to look at how I'm feeling and ask, what is my life trying to tell me right now that I need to do and be okay with that? How can I get curious about what I need from other people and from the universe? How can I get my needs met in ways that will be healing, healing and help me persevere? Or to quote the late Mary Oliver, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I know I'm well aware that this sermon is very aspirational. I know that some of the things that I have said will be difficult, especially in a world of inequality and oppression. Systemic changes will be necessary to ensure that everyone is able to find support to follow what they know they need to do. But when it comes down to it, isn't that the problem? that we live in a society that's so prescriptive, 
that we can't even do the things that would feed us without risking our access to basic necessities? In any case, I've been making baby steps towards taking my own needs seriously for years now, towards judging myself less. I'm a lot better than I once was, and I'm a lot better at speaking up when I need space and consideration. What I hope for is a world that recognizes that people are not machines. We are living beings with hopes and dreams who have, each have unique needs we need to fulfill. I hope that in the long run, we will find ways to create a world where everyone can take care of themselves in just and compassionate ways. And if you're feeling the need for change, I hope I can support you in your quest to listen to your one wild and precious life as well. May it be so. I'd like to invite you to join me in our closing hymn, which is hymn number 168 in the great hymnal, One More Step. The words will be shared on screen. Join me in extinguishing our chalices. You will find the words on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please join us now for our song benediction. Go forth into the world in peace, in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast and with Our benediction is from Kendall R. Gibbons. There is finally only one thing required of us, that is, to take life whole, the sunlight and shadows together, to live the life that is given us with courage and humor and truth. We have such a little moment out of the vastness of time for all our wondering and loving. Therefore, let there be no half-heartedness. Rather, let the soul be ardent in its pain, in its yearning, in its praise. 
Then shall peace enfold our days, and glory shall not fade from our lives. Amen. Blessed be, and go in peace.